thanks everyone for coming. I'm Christy Freeland, and uh, I was uh, really delighted to be asked to moderate this session, and particularly so after spending about an hour drinking smoothies at the Google <laughs> Cafe uh, with Sendil Mulainatham, okay-ish pronunciation, good, good. Uh, who is a truly brilliant behavioral economist at Harvard. And my job today is to ask him about his brilliant ideas and also to give all of us a sense of who the guy is. So I'm going to start by asking you about the paper you're writing right now about angel technologies. What are they and why should we care? Yeah, let me start with my favorite example, partly because it affects me personally every day. Um, you know, every night when I go to bed, I always set my alarm clock at 6.30, 6.20, something like that. I have a lot of goals when I go to bed at 11 or 12. I'm going to get up at 6.20. I'm going to go for a run. I'm going to write poetry. I don't know, something. They're always good goals. At 6.20, one of the um, great evils of society is realized, which is the snooze bar, because at 6.20, I don't want to jog or write poetry, or rather, no, I do want to jog, I do want to write poetry, I just want to do it starting at 6.30. So when I hit the snooze bar, of course at 6.30, you can see what happens. This is an interesting problem, I like this problem for a few reasons. One, I've been through this many, many, many times, and I still haven't mastered it. Two, there's a technology here that's not helping me that much. After all, the alarm clock isn't doing, in a way, what I would want it to do, which is to get me up at the time that I wanted it to get me up. And so there's a, a nice product on the market called Clocky, which is this alarm clock with wheels. And what it does is it rolls off the edge of the bed, goes off in a random direction, and then starts beeping. So you can imagine at 620, you have to get up and find Clocky. So now you do get up at 620. So this is a nice metaphor that I think captures something that technology can do for us. So in this case, what Clocky is doing for me is that, you ever seen these cartoons where like, there's like an angel on the shoulder and a devil on the shoulder and the devil's trying to get you to do something and the angel's trying to get you to do something better. And I often think of many things in life as having an angel and a devil and there's a little fight. What Clocky does is it arms the angel up. It gives the angel a little more ammunition to accomplish what the angel wants to accomplish. And so I think that clocky for me is a metaphor for a type of technology that we will start to see consumers um, increasingly demanding and firms increasingly figuring out how to provide, which are not things like technologies that just, you know, Coke tastes good, I'm going to get it. But they're technologies that help us be the people we want to be. This is not someone else telling me you ought to do X. It's me saying, I really struggle with this, and I would love if something could help me do this better. And so once I noticed this with Clocky, I started looking around, and it is sort of an emerging trend. Sort of, it's very nascent, but it's nice to find these trends before you know, they start to get full-blown, and we can name it. And there's a few products, I think, that are starting to fill this space up. And it's an interesting space also because of what I do, which is behavioral science. Because I think behavioral science can move from the lab to actually almost a form of engineering. If we know these are the things that make people tick, can we use these insights to engineer things? What, what are other tools, what are other things that we can do like Clocky? Um, so I'm, I'm going to volunteer an alternative to Clocky, which doesn't have a snooze button, and in my own personal life's case, that's three children. <laughs> um, but it is a lot more expensive and time-consuming, so I will grant dog, you that. Or a dog, I suppose. That's Wouldn't know about the dog, but the kids definitely <laughs> do it. Uh, so the book you're working on now, Sindel, is called The Eternal Bank. What is The Eternal Bank, and whose idea is it? So, yeah, so the, the, that's the book I'm working on next, so I should say. Um, it's always the case that you're planning to do things, as you can imagine. Uh, that's, a, that's a book about my dad. And it comes, from the, it comes from this thing. He once called me, and he said, uh, you're an economist, right? And this was 12 years after my PhD, so you would think he would know that I was an economist. But okay, anyway, just a little said, footnote here. You were a tenured professor of economics at Harvard at the time. At the time, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. yeah okay, so I said yes. You had a few credentials. A little bit, yeah. So I said yes, and then he said, well, I, I need your help on something. I said, okay, what? He said, I want to start a bank. 
And my dad has nothing to do with banking. He has nothing to do with any of this. And so I was about to explain to him that it's a little harder to start a bank than you might think. But then I figured, why bother? Just tell me why do you want to start a bank? And he had this idea. He said, there are a lot of people out there who believe in reincarnation. And why should they go into the next life without money? They've accumulated a lot of money in this life. Let them take that money into the next life. So they'll come to this bank and they'll give us um, their money and some passcodes. And when they're reincarnated, if they're reincarnated, they can come back, recover their passcodes. Because they'll know, remember? Somehow. It's going to pass no on idea. to your new I have no idea. self. <laughs> yeah, I'm not as well versed in reincarnation as you might expect, given my heritage. Um, so they, they come back and they would give us the passcodes. And my dad's idea was that we win either way. Either we have concrete proof of reincarnation, or we get to float on their money. And so he said, and the best part of it is he said, and we'll call this the Eternal Bank. So the book is really about my dad is a very interesting guy, and it's about his stories and what they tell us about, and trying to understand them through social science. So this, is a, this story is emblematic for me about what is creativity, because obviously this is a very creative idea. At the same time, I don't think any of us are going to go out and set up the Eternal Bank. So there's something slightly... It's very creative. It's almost too creative. And so it's about understanding what the science of creativity is. And how can you be too creative? So I think that one thing that we're finding in um, the research on science, uh, on creativity, it's almost like, this is a gross simplification, but it's almost like there's a, a spectrum between creativity and judgment. If you almost think of creativity as being able to see the world as it might be, and judgment as being able to see the world as it is. You can see how those are in remarkable opposition. When you're very creative, you're looking past what is to what might be. When you have great judgment, part of what you do is you can really see things almost clearly for what they are. And you can see how these are in like remarkable opposition. And so that's why oftentimes creative people will say one brilliant thing and one thing where you're like, that is absolutely insane. And they'll be convinced that both of them are great ideas. And so that's the, that's the tension. And so that story for me and the research that I've been doing afterwards is around trying to understand that tension of what makes creativity. So Sindel told me this story yesterday and it really resonated with me because as it happened, uh, I had just uh, reread a paper by Robert Merton, uh, the sociologist, uh, written in the 1960s where he had surveyed, he and a colleague had surveyed a whole bunch of Nobel Prize winning scientists. And one of the findings, as the scientists sort of reported their own theories of their success and their thinking, one thing that all of them said was what was crucial was not so much being brilliant, because they said there are lots of people who are really, really smart. It was that they all felt they had a kind of intuition about where the hot and important issues were. And they knew to work on those and not to work on the others. And this sounded to me a lot like the judgment that Sendel was talking about that's so essential to creativity. Exactly. That's right. And I think that, that varies a lot. There isn't great research on this, but I think that that mix that you need varies a lot by field. So in Merton's case, he was talking to a lot of scientists. And Nobel Prizes in science are often given for things that are much more like uh, experimental advances. And when you're doing a lot of experimental advances, you need creativity. But because there's a lot of heavy lift involved, you need a lot of judgment. But if you look at art, I would speculate, and you go out in this direction, you need less judgment and a lot more just raw creativity. And it sort of varies by field. A very creative management consultant, probably not that helpful. A somewhat creative management consultant with good judgment, very helpful. So I think it matters a lot as to a very creative auditor, probably not helpful at all. Well, in some in cases, some places a it little might too be helpful, helpful, right? Exactly, exactly right. Uh, so maybe when we're advising our kids, once they finish their alarm clock rule in our lives <laughs> on uh, career choices, we should try to figure out where they are exactly. on the creativity judgment spectrum. Exactly. Uh, now, Sendel, you've talked to us a little bit about your dad, and I was really fascinated to hear about your family story. So I'm going to ask you a little bit about that. Yeah. Where were you born? So I was born in India. I was born in um, a village uh, sort of about four hours, well, actually I used to say five hours south of Chennai, but what does hours mean? It's like an interesting thing where it's like the roads keep getting better. So in effect, the village is getting closer to Chennai. So how so close is it now? Three hours. Pretty good, That's right? good. That's progress. I the infrastructure That's was progress. terrible. Uh, no, it's getting better, much better. Yeah, yeah. My, my teeth don't rattle anymore. And then how old were you when you immigrated? Uh, seven. And that was to? That was to Los Angeles. So yeah, we moved to LA, my dad was there. And then um, I was there, I, there until I went to college. 
and, and how did your dad manage to bring you guys from this small village five or three hours outside of Chennai? Uh, he came to do a PhD at Caltech, and then um, after, he was here for about four years before, um, before he could bring us. That's an example of an interesting, almost angel technology, because we didn't have a phone in our house. There may have been one in, in our village, but we didn't have a phone, so my dad would make these audio tapes where he'd talk into them and tell us what he wanted to say. And then I still remember the sort of the tapes would come and then you'd put it on the tape machine and like you'd hear your dad and it's like very interesting. It was one way, but it was still somehow intimate despite its one wayness. Did you make tapes for him? Uh no. No. I I, I never even occurred to me, so and, and what was the experience of immigration like? Was was it all on Easy Street, suddenly you got to America, the roads paved with gold? Uh, <laughs> I I mean as a kid it was just another thing. It was like different I, I mean to me it was like perfectly the only, the only odd part of it was when I was 10, um, my dad lost his job because of defense contracting rules, and he couldn't work in the sector anymore. And, and, and that was, the rule was? Oh, so the rule was that he was an aerospace engineer, but if you worked in a, any building that had a defense contract, you had to get def complete clearance, even if you weren't working on that. So he would work on commercial airlines, but still, because he wasn't a citizen, he could no longer even work on commercial airline projects. So now you can be an aerospace engineer, and the interesting part of it to me was, I still remember this moment where, it's kind of interesting, where I said to him, oh, so now you don't have a job, we're not getting money, so what happens if you don't get a job? I just, I mean, I was curious, it was interesting, and he said, I mean, what do you mean what happens? We don't have money, we don't eat. And it never even occurred to me as a child that the world would be such a place where just through chance, you could end up with such a random bad outcome. Because, you know, even when we were in India, it's not like I ever worried about not having something to eat eat per se, you might not get candy. Okay, you don't get candy. But somehow the idea that the world would be this place where there's almost no net and you can fall very far, that had a very long impact on me. Okay, I'm going to cheat and say you're working now on scarcity, right? Do you think that's connected? I think it is, yes. Yeah. So I've done a lot of work on poverty and I think, it's, I think it is very much related to it. Um, it's related to this notion. I think it's a, I think that's the, the sort of the psychology and I think all of us probably feel it in one way or another. So um, some people may feel it in money, some people may feel it in time, but that feeling of having very little and that feeling that you get when you just feel you have too little time, that's something that I'm working on now. I have a, that's the book I'm working on, which is around, it turns out that there's a, a common psychology that arises every time people have uh, too little. So there's more in common between the poor and the busy uh, and dieters and the lonely that there's a common psychology that all of those people draw upon that, uh, that, that seems to operate. It's something people haven't really noticed before. Is, is that good for us? I mean, certainly if we're on a diet, we feel pretty virtuous. If we're very busy, we feel virtuous, we're working hard. D does, it, does scarcity make us better? Yeah, so that's one of the interesting things. It's like scarcity has these amazing benefits because it focuses our mind. So we find, and others have found, for example, when you're working busy, people are far more effective when they're on deadlines than they ever could be. And you know, you, you've all This is well known to journalists, yes. by the way. I think it's well known to most of us, I think. Right? Any, any student who's like, wow, with five hours left, I wrote a term paper that I couldn't write in five weeks, kind of understands that, you know, the power, the motivating aspect of deadlines. And it's not just bit time, though. So for example, the poor, this is an interesting fact, I think most people, I mean, in our research it came out, I think it's the opposite of what most people anticipated the poor are much better managers of their money than the rich, significantly better managers, in the sense that they, I mean, in every sense, just like, you're, just like when you're very short on time, you become a very good manager of time, the poor are better managers of money. So in many ways, scarcity does what you'd expect it to do. The mind reacts by saying, we have very little of this resource, let's marshal all our mental resources to focus it. But there is a very bad side to scarcity, which is probably, um, in the long run, outweighs the benefit, which is because the mind is so focused on it, uh, it, it focuses involuntarily. So for example, uh, what's it? so think of the following. You have a project that is due, like you're working on a, uh, an article. The deadline is the next evening, the next afternoon it's due. You go home, you're going to spend time with your kids because you haven't seen them in a while. There's nothing you can do on that project right now anyway. But while you're with your kids, your mind keeps going back to, 
the project. You haven't done work on the project, and you haven't enjoyed your time with your kids. And they probably haven't enjoyed you And either. they haven't enjoyed you either. You're a worse parent. In that moment, you are a worse parent. And what that's doing is it's because scarcity is loading your mind. It's creating, it's as if, there's a, it's as if you had a mental processor. And part of that processor is constantly being taxed. It's like your computer when you have like too many windows open. Part of it is being taxed by this other process that's continually running. And so as a result, what it means is people who are under conditions of scarcity, when they're trying to do anything, they are significantly worse. And so we find some striking evidence, for example, that when somebody becomes poor, the same person, when they're in times of poverty, their IQ drops significantly, a lot. Um, and other measures, psychologists have these measures called executive control, which is what you use to exercise self-control, which is what you use to focus. Those drop quite a bit. In fact, the orders of magnitude are such that it's almost like when you become poorer, it's almost like being moderately inebriated. So there are very big effects on cognitive load. But it's not about being poor. It's not about the people. The same person, when they get more money, the mind recovers because now the cognitive load is gone. And it turns out the same is true for people who are on diets. So, is, so we found, we went and looked, and there have been a lot of trials around diets. And when people are put onto diets, not from the nutrition aspect, they're getting plenty to eat from, the, from that point of view. That's true of the poor, by the way, that we study. It's not nutrition. But when they're put onto the diet, even effective diets, people lose quite a few IQ points while being on the diet. Because part of their mind is constantly, well, thinking about food. And that makes them less effective in whatever it is they're doing. And so that, to me, was interesting because it kind of, as, as economists, we tend to think of scarcity as, um, I remember when I was telling one of my economist colleagues that, oh yeah, I'm working on this sort of new research on scarcity. They looked at me like I was an idiot because they said, well, there's already a science of scarcity. It's called economics, <laughs> which is true. But this I think is an older type person? No, it was a younger type person. <laughs> they probably just didn't like me. The, um, but what they, were, what they were alluding to, which is right, economists are brilliant at recognizing that everything in the world is scarce. If you spend money on X, you don't have money to spend on Y. So let's call that physical scarcity. What I think economists don't, haven't understood, and they don't really, maybe they don't care to understand, is that physical scarcity doesn't mean psychological scarcity. So I'll give you an example. Like most people in this room are lucky enough not to have money scarcity. But you do have money scarcity. You have a budget constraint. However much money you have, you have a physical amount of money. right? So we know from an economist's point of view, you're experiencing scarcity. But let me show you from a psychology point of view that you're not experiencing scarcity. If you were to lose $20 or 20 francs or whatever the currency might be from your pocket, you went out for a jog and it fell out, you might be annoyed at yourself. You might say to yourself, ah, that's stupid. I shouldn't have lost that. But you never ask yourself a question that people who are actually experiencing money scarcity ask themselves, which is the question, I'm now $20 poorer, what am I not going to buy? It doesn't feel like you've lost anything, in some sense, except a piece of paper. Of course, we know from the physical point of view, you have lost more than a piece of paper. You must be buying $20 less of stuff, because that's what the budget constraint is, but it never feels that way. In fact, people who are experiencing money scarcity, most definitely, that's when you ask them free form, Questions such as this, the f one of the first things they report is, well, I have to figure out what I'm not going to buy. Now, take time scarcity. If an hour of your life is lost because your plane is delayed and you're a very busy, busy person, you very much ask yourself, what am I not going to do? If an hour is lost on a Sunday afternoon that was a relaxing day, you don't ask yourself. So that's the sense in which there's a big divide between the physical scarcity, which economists are right to point out exists everywhere, and this psychological scarcity, which is a remarkable feature of the mind, to allow us to feel like we have millions of $20 bills, endless amounts of $20 bills. Uh, so when you told me about this work yesterday, I was very delighted, Sindel, as I told you, uh, for one reason, which is I have been thinking that I really should go on a diet, but I'm also finishing a book, which the second draft is due in two weeks. And I had told myself that I would just not start the diet until after the manuscript is done on the ground, so it was too hard to do both things at once. So I now, I felt immediately vindicated and celebrated by having a huge meal last night. So that was great, thank you. Um, but are, are there other practical 
lessons you can offer us. So your story about the parent who has work and isn't, has, has made a choice to be with her or his children, has the work to do later, I think probably everyone in this room who has kids is familiar with that. Um, and we hate it, so how can we do better? So I think that, um, let's, let's go back to where we started a little bit. I think that's where the angel technologies can be very, very powerful. I think what we can start doing is we can start getting attuned to consumer needs that are of this type. So that is, there are quite a few consumer demands that are of the type of, I'd like to do better at X. I want to be this person. Or I want to do these behaviors, but I'm not able to. We can diagnose what's causing the wedge between, I call this intention and action, but you might want to say between wanting and doing. But whatever is causing the wedge between wanting and doing, we now have tools in behavioral science to understand that. So for example, one of the reasons there's that wedge, and we all know this from eating, is pure self-control. You don't want to eat that donut. But then when you see the donut, you're like, oh, this donut looks really good. Maybe I'll eat this donut. But there are other things which are as important, in fact, arguably more important, but people underappreciate, um, which one of them I think of as probably even more important than raw self-control, which is mind wandering. So you want to, I'll give the most prosaic example of this, but that's also very important in the world. You're a diabetic. You've been diagnosed with this, what used to be deadly and vicious disease, but now is controllable through uh, taking um, pills, let's say, let's say your early stages. So when the doctor tells you this, you say, wow, it's really unfortunate, but I'm, I'll take my pills. So that's what you want to do. The reality is we know from the data that the average rate of pill taking is maybe about 65%, roughly, 65 to 75%. That's not good, because that means you're getting efficacy well below what you should be, and that leads to a lot of consequences. So that's a, a wedge between wanting and doing. Now what's causing it? I think sort of mind wandering, forgetting, inattention is one of the biggest sources of this. Because after all, you live a busy life. It's four in the afternoon. You were supposed to take your pill at lunchtime. You just forgot. But now it's back at home. And, and life moves on. So you miss it today. And that's because diabetes is asymptomatic. Nothing, the devil in this case, is not a strong devil. It's the neutral devil of kind of indifference. You're like, well, nothing is that wrong right now. The angel can't be as loud as that indifference, basically. There's nothing for the angel to say, no, no, but you have to take it. It's very consequential. So there's this company that's created a way of making the angel very loud, and it's called Glow Caps. And what they do is, I call it the passive-aggressive pill bottle. So it's got a little light, and if you don't take it, it starts by blinking. It's like, oh, I really want attention. I haven't, you haven't talked to me, so if you don't open the pill bottle. But then if you don't open it after the blinking, it starts beeping. And if you don't open it after the beeping, this really is like a, like a friend who really needs attention. It starts sending you text messages. <laughs> and so that's an example where you can see, you can diagnose the wanting and doing. And in clinical trials, they're finding that to be very effective at increasing adherence. But there are many more places than just taking, um, taking pills. So let's go back to parenting. So a very specific example I often think about is if you ask parents, how good do you think it is to raise your voice in anger at your kids? Most parents will say, that's not a good idea. I mean, you need to be stern, you need to be firm. Maybe you need to raise your voice because that's the right thing to do at that moment, but you shouldn't do it just because you're angry. I think a lot of parents would say that. I hope. Um, but, of course, when you ask them, well, how often have you done it in the last week? They'll say, well, okay, I've done it quite a few times. And that's not good. Now, that's a great example between wanting and doing. Now, and I think technology can understand how we can solve that problem too. Like, introspect for yourself a little bit about what happens in that moment. Again, it's a little bit of mind wandering. You get so caught up that you're just like, if there was a technology at that moment that sensed, oh look, there's a rise in your volume. Let's just have a bracelet that detects it and then buzzes silently to you, it brings you back. Well, I can tell you, Sandil, if there were such a bracelet, my children would be giving it to me exactly. for every exactly. holiday. Um, we only have a few minutes yeah. left, so I, I want to ask you one final question, which is, what makes you do what you do? What, what, what excites you about your job? What, what 
what right. wakes what gets you up in the morning not what keeps you up at night but what gets you up in the morning apart from the little clocky thing <laughs> uh, i think it's two things one is um because of my experiences in life i feel like i would love to i value doing things that have social value and do something i've been incredibly lucky and so when you look back and say wow i'm really lucky it, it's a little unnerving because having been so lucky you feel it's flip of a coin and there are other people who have not been lucky and who are surely more talented and so trying to kind of get put some put something back but the other thing that drives me at some visceral level is I was telling a student of mine this the other day it's like I love desserts and uh, there's this chocolate chip cookie that I really love in New York it's this Levan bakery it's possibly the best chocolate chip cookie in the world and when you eat that cookie it's amazing it's like your mouth fills with like incredible pleasure for me, when you have like a good idea, I would say it's the same visceral pleasure. It's like, you're f it's not like any random idea, but when the idea finally comes together and you say, oh, that makes sense. It's the same kind of just raw, just pleasure of like having seen it. And unlike the chocolate chip cookie, you have this other sort of egotistical advantage of like, I might be the first person to have this idea. Probably not true, but you know, egotistically, you can fool yourself into saying that. And that's, a real pleasure. Okay, I can't resist this slightly naughty question. So having a great idea as good as this fabulous chocolate chip cookie, do you compare it to sex also when you talk to your well, students? Well, that's, no, I do not compare it to sex when talking to my students. So I, uh, we have certain rules at Harvard, which uh, some of our faculty break, but no. When no, talking I'm to us, gonna... you're safe you're among friends. Uh, <laughs> is this being videotaped? We'll edit this out later. Uh, no, it's different than sex. Let's leave it at that. So, there's only one person involved. So. Um, I, I cheated and I'm going to ask you one last, last question. What's the big idea or the big subject, apart from the ones you've told us, that you would really like to have that breakthrough idea about? That's a good question. So I, I think that the, the thing I'm nibbling around the edges at, with Angel Technologies is part of sort of a Ideas 42, which is a, a social venture we've set up and has a lot of good people. And the thing that we're nibbling around the edges and really perfecting is the thing we'd love a breakthrough on. I think we're close, but we're not there, which is if you look at behavioral science, whether it's economics or psychology, there are fields that are not, they're almost like science, like physics is. They're not engineering. And the biggest advantages, that it, some of the biggest breakthroughs in physics came from engineering, by which I mean where you take a real problem and you actually try and solve it. And I would love to see, and that's what we've been doing at Ideas42, I would love to see a way that we can actually become engineers. Engineering is a discipline. It has, it's a science in a way. It, has, it uses scientific tools. It uses analysis. And I think right now where social science is, is it's almost like the applied stuff is considered like a, somebody will do it. It's I just mean, guys at Harvard eating chocolate chip cookies, as it were, exactly. not connected to the real world. Right. And I think that in a way when we have a more robust field of engineering, just like in physics, it'll transform even pure science. Because when you go out and try stuff, you realize, okay, this isn't going well. There's something we have wrong. And we're already finding that in some of our projects, behavioral ideas that look great in the lab. You go try them on some project and you're like, this isn't working at all. Which then makes you question, well, what do we do in the, wrong, in the lab experiment that wasn't so representative of the world? And so that, that would be the idea that I would love to see in the next 15 years, is to say, well, we created a field of sort of almost engineering in this area. And I think that could be transformative for the world. Okay, well, thank you so much. Uh, I have been really fascinated by everything you've had to say today and by our conversation tomorrow. I'm sure everyone else here has been too, and we will all want to buy your book. <laughs> so when is it going to be published and what will the title be? Oh, the title is a sore subject. I don't have a title, but it's published in January. So. And, and this, is this, this is the scarcity the book? The scarcity book, The scarcity yeah. book, and who's the publisher? Uh, uh, Holt, uh, Times Books. Publishing is weird. It's got this huge hierarchy. Every publisher is owned by some other publisher. But this is Times Books. Okay, Times Books, something about scarcity. Sendil Malignatham. I don't think there'll be lots of people with that name publishing a book in this not. area in yeah. January. Yeah, yeah. And, and we will all buy it. Uh, thank you so much. A great, thank great you very pleasure. Much.